So what is a BEP? It's actually a document in which you're going to outline which biological risk can occur to the patient or to the healthcare provider when using your medical device and in which you're also going to explain how you're going to address or mitigate this biological risk. So in your overall biocompatibility strategy, we are just here. It's your first primary stage before you actually proceed with any testing and before, of course, you evaluate the results of this testing to conclude on whether or not your product is safe to the patient. So if you've been working in the medical device industry for quite some time, you're probably wondering why this document needs to be performed because in practice it was not made in the past. So I think to answer to this question, we need to see where we are coming from. And if you're also working in the medical device industry for quite some time, I'm sure you will recognize this biocompatibility evaluation chart. So when I started at Nelson Labs, I used to work with this one, and it was very easy to use. So you just needed to understand how your device was actually contacting the patient for how long, and then just in front of your eyes, for example, all of the tests that you needed to perform were just popping. So it was very easy, but there were very strong limitations with this approach. It's that actually it did not hold the manufacturer responsible for understanding his product. What are my materials? Are there standard materials in the medical device industry? What is the impact of my manufacturing process, of my sterilization, on my packaging? And how does my testing relate to actually my products? So because of this, there were all a thinking process in the ISO committee on how to change this way of thinking. And it came with a new title. So this title is not new, but because before the content was not in line with the title, it did not achieve its actually intended purpose. So with the new ISO 1093-1 from 2018, the content is hopefully more in line with the title. So what is the title? It's Part one, evaluation and testing within a risk management process. And what is risk? It's actually the combination of the probability of occurrence <laughs> of harm and the severity of that harm. So in other words, how likely can a harm or a biological endpoint occur to the patient and how severe will this biological endpoint be? So it came with a completely new biocompatibility um, evaluation chart. So Henry already mentioned it yesterday, so I'm not going to go into very long details of it, but you can see that it's already much broader. This is the first thing which got the eye. And you see that there is much more endpoints which are added. The first one is physical and or chemical information. It is coming because once again, the people before did not understand their composition, what were their material device, actually. And so it becomes right, and you can see that it is before any other endpoint, actually, just to force you to do it in a primary stage. And then comes different new <coughs> endpoints, like pyrogenicity, for example. We was already here in the past, but not black and white listed, I would say. Subchronic and subacute are now split it, so that you see it at two different endpoints and chronic carcinogenicity, reproductive developmental toxicity and degradation are new on this list, so that also you think about them like a potential risk. Then come all kinds of X and E, which is defined as X is prerequisite information. This is your only mandatory step. This is the only thing you really need to do for any kind of medical device. E means an endpoint that needs to be evaluated, either through testing, but either by other means, for example, literature data or historical data on a prototype, on a previous device, on a predicate, or data on your raw material from your suppliers, for example. And it's also very important to note that actually there is a possibility that it will be appropriate to include additional or fewer endpoints 
that indicating on the chart. So we want to take this into account and I will show you how later on. So what is a biological <coughs> evaluation plan in this framework? So this is defined by ISO 1003 1 <coughs> So the risk management process, or the BEP, involves identification of biological <coughs> hazards, estimation of the associated biological risk, and determination of their acceptability. And Annex B.2.2 also says that it is emphasized when simply planning to conduct testing against all of the aspects of biocompatibility identified in Annex A does not meet the requirement of ISO 14971 of this document. So you cannot think in the checkbox approach like we used to do in the past. Same is actually written in the FDA guidance on ISO 1003-1. So a process of biological evaluation plan generally begin with assessment of the device, including the material components, the manufacturing processes, the clinical use of the device. And considering this information, the potential risk from a biocompatibility perspective should be identified. A plan should be developed, either by biocompatibility testing or other evaluation that appropriately address the risk. <coughs> So that is a theory, but now how we will do it in practice. So in practice, we would actually follow ISO 1003 1 clause 4, which really outlines how you should do a biological evaluation plan. So first, we will consider the configuration of your medical device. Is there any, for example, accessories that can be grafted on it, that depending on the patient, for example, we want to take this into account. What are your raw materials? Do you have any certificate like USP 87, USP 88 that could help? Do you have historical data? If your product, for example, is the new version of a previous one, can we use the previous data? What is the impact of the manufacturing? What is the impact of the packaging? And is there any literature data also on a similar device? And that will help us to define the testing strategy. So in the rest of the presentation, I will show you how we will build a biological evaluation plan. This is, of course, Nelson Lab's approach, but it's nevertheless, I think, very illustrative for you. And you will see how we will approach and take this clause into, um, into uh, approach. So first, we will look at the applicable guidelines. So for, um, I would say, most of the BEP, we will base ourselves on two or three guidelines. Of course, the whole ISO 1093 series, it's actually going from part one to nearly part 30, which is on biocompatibility of your medical device. And we will also take into account the guidance of FDA on ISO 1093. And then if you're going for European submission, we will also consider the medical device regulation. And then we will think more in an out-of-the-box <coughs> approach, like is there other biological risk that would be covered by other guidelines? So if your medical device, for example, is a breathing gas pathway that will be used to <coughs> transfer dry hair or humidified hair to the patient, then we need to also consider ISO 18562. If your product is an orthopedic implant, then you will probably have a cleaning validation as per ISO 19227, and maybe this, the data that you described here, will be helpful for the biological evaluation plan. If your product is a cream, or if it is a gel or a liquid, in contact with a container, then we are also going to take into account USP 1663, 1664, and the FDA guidance on container closure systems. In the next stage, we will understand your medical device. So what are its dimensions? Because dimension will trigger the feasibility to perform some tests, like implantation, for example. What is the intended purpose? If you have such a device, you will see that the end door will actually be old by the practitioner. This is very non-invasive. This is actually in contact with intact skin only. But this part here 
will be extremely invasive, probably going into the tissue of the patient. So we want to describe it very well so that we can take this into account also later on when we address the risk. What is the frequency of use? If your medical device is only used for 20 minutes, that's not long, that's a short-term contacting device. But if it's used three times a day, up to two months, then it falls into another category of risk. So we need to define exactly what is the contact duration. What is the patient population? Once again, we want to take this into account too. So if you're dealing with neonate, pediatrics, pregnant women, lactating women, these drive many additional risks, for example, developmental um, or um, uh, reproductive risk. So we need to take this into account. Do you have any off-lab values? So I want to make a small aparte on this one. So if you wrote in your instruction for use that your medical device can only be used, for example, with intact skin for less than 30 days, and with adult use, but you go to your healthcare facility, for example, and the practitioner tell you, well, actually, you know, we use it with open wounds for probably blood contact, you know, for a much longer time than 30 days and with very, um, I would say, a sensible population, like neonates, once again, then you need to re-perform a risk evaluation. You just cannot close your eyes. You need to take this into account and see if there is additional risk that you need to consider. And actually, we see this. So we see that the authorities can come back to you and tell you, well, your EFU is not in line with common practice. You need to reconsider your categorization. And all this aims at having a good device categorization. So if you're making a wrong device categorization, in 90% of the case, your risks are not going to be well addressed. Your testing phase two will also not be well addressed. And your conclusion in phase three on patient safety will also be not correct. Then we want to do material characterization. So we want to understand every material that is used in your medical device. Is it standard material, like if it's polyethylene, polypropylene, stainless steel, then maybe we can use some data on literature or on previous medical device. If you're dealing, again, with an orthopedic implant, then you may have a cleaning validation in place, as per ISO 9227. So this will maybe help us to address also some biological endpoints. And then this is at this stage that we want to see if we will or not need more data on your medical device. So actually, do we need to perform chemical characterization? So I always feel like there is some confusion on what is saying ISO 10993-18. So it's not saying that you should, in all cases, perform chemical characterization. It tells you that you need, actually, to understand your medical device. And if needed, you can go to chemical characterization to get more information. So we will put this into practice, and why is it the case? So we will base ourselves on ISO 10993-18, this specific sentence. So the extent of characterization required is determined by the invasiveness and duration of clinical exposure in the intended use. So if you have a device which is contacting the patient, very short-term contact, like 20 minutes, you know, or only with intact skin. It's, of course, not bringing the same amount of risk, but if you have a device which is a permanent contacting one. And also, we need to think that, iso that chemical characterization can be extremely useful to address some very long-term biocompatibility tests. So I want to show it to you. This is actually based on ISO 10993-1. So the choice of test procedure shall take into account that certain biological tests, meaning those designed to assess systemic effects, are not justifiable where the presence of leachable chemicals have been excluded or where chemicals have a known and acceptable toxicity profile. So that means that if actually you perform chemical characterization and you are able to show through a toxicological assessment on these chemicals at this specific dose that your product will be safe 
from a chemical characterization point of view, of course, then it can help you to address systemic endpoints. So systemic decks, acute, subacute, subchronic, and chronic, but also general toxicity, carcinogenicity, and reproductive developmental toxicity. So lots of endpoints. But if you look at it carefully, you see that these endpoints are actually mostly relevant for, sorry, long-term contacting medical device and not so much for short-term contacting medical device. So we will put this into practice. And for example, for limited contacting device, we would a priori go more for an identification and an understanding of the materials and processing. For a long-term contacting device, we would actually perform chemical characterization because it will help us to address these very long-term endpoints. And for prolonged, we are a little bit in the gray zone. So that would be upon discussing with you or looking at how invasive it is of what is the patient population, for example. And if we decide that chemical characterization is needed, then we will define how we are going to do it. So what will be the strategy? Are we going to go for an exaggerated extraction or an exhaustive extraction? What would be the threshold of toxicological concern that we are going to start with? Which solvents are we going to use? If you're, for example, dealing with an uh, implantable device, we would mostly use free, as the FDA requires, polar, apolar, and midpolar. But if you're with an indirect contacting device, then maybe only one solvent, a polar one, will be enough. Which techniques are we going to use? Mostly screening for volatile, semi-volatile, non-volatile, and elements. And we will repeat again that at the end of chemical characterization, we need to do a toxicological assessment of the detected compounds. So I like to say that, you know, performing chemical characterization without toxicological assessment is like trying to translate a, re a hieroglyph without your Rosetta stone. It's just not working. It's not giving you any in information. So you really need to perform a toxicological evaluation on the chemical characterization results, because this is only this which is will be able to tell you how safe the detected compounds at their specific dose are to the patient, and that will help you also to address these systemic endpoints. So we understand our medical device, we know how it is processed, we know how it is manufactured, and now we can identify what are the relevant biological endpoints. So maybe some endpoints can be addressed through literature, then we want to also say it again here. Maybe some endpoints will be addressed through chemical characterization. We will also repeat it here because we never repeat it enough for the authority. And if we define that an endpoint needs to be addressed through testing, we will say how. So for example, if you need to do a cytotoxicity test, we will say exactly which cytotoxicity test is useful to determine patient safety. <coughs> for example, does it need to be a MEM elution, which is a qualitative test, or does it need to be a MTT, XTT test with or without dilution, which is more quantitative? If you go to a Japan submission, do we need to do a V79 colony assay? So we want to describe this also in the BEP. And if some tests are not relevant to your product, like for example, it's a gel, or it's a liquid, uh, or it's a cream, like implantation, for example. We just know directly implantation is not going to work for this kind of product. I mean, there will be nothing anymore after one day. So we want to explain why we are not going to address implantation through a standard, the standard test. Then, once we know the test that we need to perform, we will define which sample we are going to test. So maybe you're very lucky, and maybe your device can be tested straight ahead, just like this. Maybe not. For example, it's a very complex, a very big medical device, or it's extremely expensive. And then you need to actually make a replicate of it, a smaller replicate or a bigger replicate. So that would be a coupon. Maybe you have a family of different medical devices, which all have different length, as here for this needle, for example. And it would seem very strange to test all of the length. So you want to see if there is one which can be worst case and represent all the other one. And that would be a family grouping. 
If you have many different colorants, maybe you want to find a way to combine these colorants to together and only test one device which contain, I would say, a representative or all the colorants, and that would be a monster product or a Frankenstein device sometimes we hear this too. Exclusion of components. So the components who do not have any patient contact, we will not uh, use them for testing because they will just dilute the extract. And we will remove all the electronic components because they never work. They don't work for biocompatibility, they don't work for chemistry, they work for nothing. <laughs> Except during in use, of course. <laughs> And the contacting manner. So once again, if you have such device, there will be some risks which are relevant to the patient and to the healthcare provider, like irritation, sensitization, cytotoxicity, for example. But some risk will be only relevant to the patient. So we want to take this into account because it might need that we need to test a different device for each specific test. <coughs> And then we want to describe how we will perform the extraction, generally with a polar and apolar solvent. But maybe, once again, if you're with an indirect contacting device, polar will be enough, for example. The ratio, normally we generally go with surface area, if we can. This is what the authority prefer. And then we will describe the time and temperature. So we would go for 37 degrees for 24 hours for cytotoxicity. But if you are dealing with an implant, you need, and even I would say, some kind of prolonged contacting medical device. Maybe 37 degrees for 72 hours will be needed, especially for the FDA. For all of our testing, and I mean, want to emphasize in vitro and in vitro, in vivo testing, this is not applicable straight for chemical characterization, we will go for 50 degrees for 72 hours. If you don't do 50 degree, like if you do 37 degree, you need to justify it. In practice, it only works if you can demonstrate that your device would, for example, degrade at 50 degree. 37 degree is not allowed otherwise. And then I'm reaching the moment where we would a little bit step out of, you know, uh, take a little bit of distance and look at all this from far away. Is there extra consideration that we need to take into account for your specific medical device? So if your medical device is biodegradable, we want to know how fast it's going to degrade. But also, we want to know how it's going to degrade. So there is all kinds of different, you know, subcomponents that will appear. Could any one of them be toxic to the patient? This is relevant, we want to know this. So we need to take this into account. If your device is very, very small, like a nanoparticle, and you inject it in one specific position, then maybe a part of it will go to another position through the bloodstream, for example. And then maybe it will go to the liver, or maybe it will go to the brain. But then what would be the toxicity of your medical device when it's going to the brain? So we want to also take this into account. And then drug device interaction. So if you're dealing with um, combination products, I'm sure that you're thinking about what kind of leachables could go out of my medical device and go into the drug product during use, and could these leachable compounds be toxic to the patient? But you can look at it from a different angle. You can think, can my medical device somehow interact with the drug product and make it less efficient. Like, for example, if you're dealing not with a kind of drug product like a protein, can your medical device denature the protein? And then maybe this new protein will be toxic in nature, or maybe it's not going to work anymore, and in a way it will also be toxic. So believe it or not, we actually see that some medical device do have an influence on the efficacy of some drugs. And then, there is many different over endpoints, but this is just to show you a little bit of thinking process. So I'm reaching the conclusion of the BEP, which also corresponds to the conclusion of my presentation. <laughs> but just to summarize in a very high level perspective how we would actually work. So we think about what are the applicable guidances, which are going to also show the different risks. 
and we understand what is the manner and time of contacting of your medical device to have an appropriate device categorization. Then we understand which materials are used and we define if chemical characterization is needed. Then we select the test and we define how each test is going to be performed, which sample, which extraction condition. And then we think, is there any additional endpoints, risk, that needs to be considered, which are not straightforward as per ISO 10 and 3 one So once again, we are here and you can see that if you have a BEP, it will make going into step two, which will be the testing phase, very easy because everything will be described in your BEP. But hopefully it will also make step going into step three a smooth process because you will have captured all your risk in your BEP and hopefully you will not have any bad surprise. So I believe this is actually because of this that we see that more and more now the notified body are asking for a biological evaluation a plan. That's the end. <laughs>